Um, I'm going to ask you to go ahead and mute yourself. Um, and if appropriate, you can unmute when necessary. So take it away, Mark. Welcome, everyone. Yeah, thanks everyone for uh, joining us this uh, morning. It's great to see everyone uh, from Colorado, perhaps. I don't know where that's real or, uh, or virtual, but uh, anyway, it's great to see everybody. I hope everyone's doing well uh, for February's edition of, of Tobin Talks. We're gonna cover um, a couple of different topics. Um, the first is I uh, wanna talk about our upcoming series uh, on um, ADL Southwest Region Special Series, uh, which we are going to be promoting uh, starting very soon. Um, and there are a couple of series which uh, we will be um, debuting really throughout the year. We don't have the dates yet, uh, but we'll be determining them very soon. And um, wanted to, you know, share them with you and, and talk about um, the content. Uh, the first one is on understanding systemic racism. Uh, there's going to be three parts uh, to that. Um, but before we uh, get to that, um, I, I'd like to, to kind of ask some, some true or false questions and kind of uh, get y'all's uh, thoughts and understanding on the definition of systemic racism, because um, it's not everybody has the same definition, number one, and, and number two, um, it can be a little bit confusing, which is why we wanna do this series uh, to help people understand exactly what it is. So here's the first question. Your answers are anonymous, by the way. No pressure. But there aren't very many of us. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> okay. All right. Number two. Um, okay, hold on. Oh. Getting there. Everybody weigh in. Okay, you ready for number three, Mark? Number three. Uh, Hold on, what happened to my polls? go to number three. Hold on. Just building up the anticipation. <laughs> right, that's it. Okay, and number three, here we go. Sorry about that. Right. 
so uh, question number three, I think, had the, the biggest difference uh, between people uh, choosing choosing true and false. So let's close these up and now get back to the share. Okay, so the first question, um, I think everybody agreed that this was true, uh, that systemic racism is a combination of systems, institutions, and factors, um, and y'all can read the rest. Um, that is true. Uh, the second question, uh, I think most of y'all thought that this was true, that uh, one person or even one group of people uh, did not create systemic racism. Uh, rather, it is uh, grounded in the history of our laws and institutions, uh, which were created in a foundation of white supremacy and exists in the institutions and policies that advantage white people and disadvantage people of color. That is also true. Uh, now, the third question, uh, there was more discrepancy, uh, and I imagine there would be, um, and that is, what is white supremacy in question two referring to? Um, and the question was, is it referring to extremist e ideologies uh, that believe that white people are genetically or culturally superior to non-whites, or that white people should live in whites-only society? And that is false. Uh, this definition of systemic racism, um, I've taken from, uh, from ADL. It's uh, the defi definition that we have uh, uh, placed, uh, and it's on our webpage. It was last updated in July, uh, and I'll let you read it uh, and take a look at it uh, real quick, and particularly the asterisk. And the reason that I, I changed that last question uh, wasn't really just to uh, cause people to have a, a false question or anything like that, but really just to, to provide um, uh, an understanding that this is a, a confusing issue, which is why we want to have this series um, on helping people understand what is and what isn't systemic racism. Uh, so the series uh, is going to be doing that by providing three examples of how systemic racism um, has affected our country uh, by going through examples in the healthcare industry. Uh, the second series will examine banking, finance, and housing, and the last will examine uh, education. And we'll be looking at it with speakers uh, by people who uh, can, can kind of provide overviews, sort of an academic perspective uh, with people who have been involved in the various industries, but also people who have been impacted, kind of the consumers of healthcare, uh, the users of healthcare, uh, people who have uh, suffered through the education system or, or the consumers of in finance uh, and, uh, and housing. And, um, and Iris, and you raise a, a great question and, uh, Today, all I can say is uh, not to, to be a teaser, um, but stay tuned for the series because uh, today is really just a, a part of the promo and, um, and we will be uh, looking at some of these issues as, uh, as we move forward. So uh, I'm not trying to uh, uh, you know, avoid, avoid the question, um, but I also wanna uh, also promo our second series uh, that we will be, um, uh, pushing out, uh, and and they'll be not uh, necessarily uh, all in consecutive order. We'll be kind of mixing them up throughout the year, uh, and that is on responding to disinformation. Uh, we're calling it dis, uh, responding to disinformation age uh, local perspectives, a and uh, essentially this uh, the genesis of this idea came from uh, our internal discussions, um, clearly in terms of what's been transpiring over the last few years um, about 
the reasons why the January 6th uh, capital insurgency happened. Uh, and then also, you know, I was listening to uh, uh, a story, I think it was on NPR or, or somewhere, about uh, the media's responsibility and about the challenges that the media has been facing. Because the media, people who, you know, have gone to journalism school and have always sort of been taught that there are two sides to every story and it's uh, a good journalist seeks out both sides. But what happens when one of those sides is completely false, uh, and you know, and, and so do they have an obligation then to still tell both sides, or if so, how do they tell it? And, and so we're now in a in a really different uh, framework, and wanted to be able to uh, provide some uh, insight into how um, our community is handling and responding to this age of disinformation. And so we're going to be focusing on the media. Uh, the corporate world and our community, other nonprofits, um, other community leaders. And one piece that I just wanted to uh, to, to leave y'all with here is the difference between uh, disinformation and misinformation. And while I'm sure that this series will also cover some misinformation, we're really going to be focusing on disinformation. And disinformation um, is, you know, the big, biggest difference is it is false information which is intended to mislead. Um, and it's especially propaganda by a government organization uh, you know, to rival uh, or, or media. Uh, whereas misinformation is false information that is spread regardless of whether uh, there is an intent to mislead or not. And so the focus of this series will really be um, uh, on disinformation. Uh, false equivalency, uh, absolutely, Paul, and that's where uh, you know you you find these arguments where um, you know to the to the media in particular or to uh, to office holders where you know they make this uh, this argument that um, you know you need to, to to cover both sides essentially um, because uh, there's they're they're similar. Uh, and, and the arguments are similar when when they're really not when when one of the arguments is just patently false um, in 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 essence. So uh, we will hopefully be having uh, a lot more details that we'll be rolling out uh, very soon. I think the first program, which will be on systemic racism in the healthcare industry, uh, is is being planned for uh, early March, and uh, we'll have that uh, information very very soon. So, uh, so stay, stay tuned for that. Um, I also wanted to take uh, the time today to talk about something that's really critical that uh, we are, are promoting. And this is, once again, also in direct response to what happened on January 6th, but, but also to what's been happening you know, over the last few years. Uh, we are calling it the PROTECT plan. Uh, it is not just one uh, piece of legislation or one uh, project. It is essentially um, a package of ideas and concepts that we are going to be rolling out over the next days, weeks, and months on how can we protect our democracy? How can we protect um, all those who are vulnerable to the disinformation and hate uh, that is being promoted and is being circulated and uh, by the people who have been animated uh, by the deeds that have transpired over the last uh, you know, month and six weeks. So I really think that this video probably explains it much better than, 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 than I can or anybody. So um, I'm just going to go ahead and... Uh, Turn this on and um, uh, y'all can watch. On January 6th, Americans watched as an insurrection fueled by violent conspiracy theories, anti-government fervor, and white supremacy attacked the seat of our democracy. Driven by years of escalating and increasingly public displays of extremism, the attack on the Capitol 
was arguably the most predictable. terrorist incident in modern American history. The forces that fueled the attack on our capital continue to pose a threat to American security and democracy. In response to that event and in an effort to address the overall increase in domestic terrorism while protecting civil liberties, ADL is announcing the PROTECT plan. The seven facets of PROTECT will significantly mitigate the threat of domestic terrorism, more so than any one policy or law, and would do so while protecting vulnerable people and communities against the risk of government overreach. The PROTECT plan priorities include adopting an approach that includes actions for federal, state, and local officials, as well as the tech industry, passing the Domestic Terrorism Prevention Act to authorize offices to address domestic terrorism and ensure those offices have resources proportionate to the threat. Taking steps to ensure that individuals associated with violent extremist movements or engaged in violent extremist activity are deemed unsuitable for employment at the federal, state, and local levels, including law enforcement and military, and not given security clearances. Funding civil society programs to address violent extremist radicalization and recruitment while ensuring these programs do not stigmatize communities. Investigating any complicity between social media companies and extremists and make social media platforms more transparent and accountable for dangerous content. Domestic terrorism is a threat that impacts everyone. Call on policymakers to act now. Extremism must end now. Uh, well, that was uh, Oren Siegel, who many of y'all um, know. He is the uh, director of our Center on Extremism, which has obviously been very, very active um, as of late. Uh, so there, there are seven facets uh, to the PROTECT plan. Um, prioritizing, preventing, and uh, countering uh, domestic terrorism, uh, resource according to the threat, opposing extremists in government service, uh, taking a domestic terrorism preventing prevention measures, um, ending the complicity in social media, uh, creating an independent clearinghouse for online extremist content, um, and targeting foreign white supremacist uh, terrorist groups. And so, you know, essentially, um, you know, the PROTECT plan, the priorities are, you know, one sort of adopting a whole of government, whole of society approach uh, to preventing and countering domestic terrorism, uh, while at the same time protecting civil liberties, uh, passing the Domestic Terrorism Prevention Act, uh, which would uh, authorize offices to address domestic terrorism and ensure that those offices have the resources uh, proportionate to the threats is a obviously a key component uh, within this uh, PROTECT plan, uh, taking steps to ensure that individuals associated with violent extremist movements um, or that engaged in violent extremist activity, um, that they are deemed unsuitable for employment at the federal, state, and local levels, including law enforcement and the military, um, is important, and particularly that they not be given security clearances um, and uh, funding civil society programs to address violent extremist radicalization and recruitment um, while ensuring that these programs uh, do not stigmatize communities. Um, and of course, once again, and I can't emphasize in this enough, investigating any complicity between social media companies and extremists and making social media platforms more transparent and accountable for their dangerous uh, content. Uh, so, um, this is something that you will be hearing a lot about, um, as I said, over the next days, months, and um, and and you know probably longer. Uh, but it is uh, it is our our response uh, to what is uh, clearly uh, some of the largest threats that not only you know we as uh, as Jews as people who um, and everyone uh, who has ever been uh, the object of of hate in this country, uh, but but our entire uh, democracy uh, has 
uh, been threatened by. And so uh, we, we welcome everyone's participation in this. Um, there are going to be many opportunities for engagement. Um, at the moment, the, the, the most primary uh, right now, there are two very, very easy things that, that y'all can do. The first is very simply sign a petition um, urging support for many of these measures. You can find that on our website at adl.org, uh, uh, protect plan. And the other is uh, to elevate uh, a number of these topics on social media. And so also uh, on our website, actually, you can get it through our, our front page. Uh, there is a social media kit. Uh, and if you go there, it'll allow you to, uh, to elevate a number of the issues surrounding the PROTECT plan. And so I urge you to do that. Um, and by the way, um, here's just a list of our websites and social media. Uh, we can also send this to you, but it's our ADL website, Southwest, um, our ADL's Twitter, Southwest Twitter, Jonathan Greenblatt's Twitter, my Twitter, uh, ADL Facebook. Um, there's a lot of information uh, that we put out on a daily basis, and we try to provide that to y'all uh, via email and and, uh, and our websites and whatnot. But uh, but staying posted and, and keeping track on social media is really the the best way to keep uh, apprised on a on a day to day basis. Um, we're gonna uh, have a few minutes for questions, but I do just want to let everybody know about some key upcoming events on the tenth. Uh, at 3.30, uh, Online Hate Uncovered will be talking about our Backspace Hate Initiative uh, and the reasons why we're doing it. On February 18th, uh, Sharon Nazarian will be speaking uh, to the World Affairs Council on the rise of anti-Semitism around the world. And then on March 8th is the International Women's Day. Uh, it's a Women's Initiative Summit. Um, and this is going to be a terrific panel discussion uh, and so uh, make sure that you don't miss that. It's going to be at noon on March 8th. Um, and if any of y'all uh, have not had a chance to get involved with ADL and some of our uh, terrific committees, um, here's a list. Um, and please let uh, any of us know um, that you'd like to get involved and we will make sure that that happens. Um, and so, um, that's that's all I've got. We've got a, a few minutes left, and uh, would love to see if you'll have any questions or comments. Feel free to unmute yourself or post a question in the chat. If you have questions or comments. or just have something to chat about. Um, all right, stop sharing. Maybe that'll help. Thought I did, thanks. <laughs> no problem. Well, if okay, no one has any questions, um, I hope that you will sign up for our programs that are coming up. Um, I know that Mark had a lot of links in his slides. I will be sending a follow-up email post this conversation so that you can have all the links that he referred to and um, you can access all of those links without having to remember what they are. Uh, yes, there's no... Uh... There's no more quizzes in terms of that, I, I promise. And the the true false was not was not graded. So um, you're not not keeping track of that. Um, the uh, uh, I, anyway, I, just, I really just want to want to thank y'all uh, and particularly in advance because on this protect plan, uh, it, this is really going to take uh, it's a heavy lift. Uh, there there are going to be many many elements to it. And uh, we're going to need everybody's uh, everybody's help uh, to to get all the things that we need uh, accomplished, um, and and a lot of it is going to be you know needs to be done sooner you know rather than later. So um, please just look out for, as we as we send out information um, about uh, some of the steps 
that you know we'll be we'll be taking and you know how you can how you can really help out in order to to get some of these things done some at the federal level but um but not not everything and and so um i'm not sure that you know in the big scheme of things and you know, there there have been many more important things that we've we've really set out to do given given the the, the threats involved and given um the objective that we're seeking to uh you know pursue Mark, if, if I may add, um, one of the things that will help you stay in touch with what's going on from an advocacy level or program level or any um, position statements that we may make, uh, obviously follow us on social media, follow Mark, uh, follow Jonathan Greenbot. You will definitely get up to the minute um, <clears throat> Uh, news and, and information there, but we also send two newsletters out each week. The first one is on Mondays, which um, highlight the things that are coming up either this week or this week and next week or next month. So pay attention to that where you can RSVP for different events. But on Friday, you we also send out a news and review. So that will also give you kind of a highlight an update of what you may have missed. And we provide links in there to kind of catch you up in case you may have missed something, missed a program, missed something in the news, missed a statement. And it also gives you opportunities where you can sign a petition or use your voice in some of our advocacy efforts. Yes, and actually that was that was the last slide. I think I cut it off too early. So, uh, so I apologize for, for not getting to that. But yes, the, the week ahead and the week in review um, are really terrific uh, items. And uh, Margie, uh, thank her for, for doing the week ahead and Dina uh, for the week in review. Um, and also, by the way, uh, uh, Lisa Stone and uh, Susan Shaw have also uh, from our staff are also on this call. So just want to recognize them um, for all their work. And uh, I think that's that takes us to the end of this edition of uh, Talks with Tobin. So thank you all so much and uh, look forward to seeing y'all uh, sometime soon. So take care. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.